Gatari. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Um, uh, this is Tono Monogatari, or The Legends of Tono. It is considered now the most famous work of the outstanding ethnologist Yanagita Kunio, who is often praised as the father of Japanese ethnology, or Minzoku Gaku. The book was published in 1910, when Yanagita was 35 years old. This thin book is a record of 119 legends, folk tales, and stories told to Yanagita by Sasaki Kizen, a young writer and a native of the village of Tona, Iwata Prefecture. Yanagita was born in the village of Tsujikawa, Kyoga Prefecture. Thus, this book is the result of the collaboration of two village natives who, brought, uh, who thought that so-called folklore should be brought into intellectual circulation. In a non-literate society, the task of transmitting the tradition lies with old people. But in Japan at that time, almost everyone was literate and uh, the age of the keeper or register of folklore was not so important as in previous times. In the foreword to Tono Managatari, Yanagita speaks without any touch of politeness about the distribution of rules. Sasaki is an honest and sincere man, but a bad storyteller. Therefore, it was he, Yanagita, who had to write down stories Sasaki told him. Yanagita moved to Tokyo uh, in 1890. At school, he was fond of poetry, first Varka and then Shintaishi, published several poems, met respected writers and young people who later became famous writers. After graduating from the Tokyo University, Yanagita became a bureaucrat. In 1909, he worked in the juridical department of the cabinet of ministers and in the ministry of the court. Uh, here we see Yanagita in formal dress. The photo on the right was taken during the preparation for the enthronement of an emperor Taisho, in which Yanagita took part. Like many other urban Japanese of that time, especially a man, Yanagita had to have both Japanese and European clothing, which contributed to the development of the Japanese textile industry. Yanagita was independent and inquisitive nature. He interested in things that he was not obliged to be interested in on duty. Having abandoned his own poetry, he did not break with literary literary circles, but devoted more and more time to the study of the folk life. He traveled a lot to distant places and villages. His observations and travel notes laid the foundations of what would later be called ethnology. The product of this interest was Tono Monogatari. People of central Japan thought of Iwate as a real, uh, as a real backwoods. Old customs and beliefs remained there. The natives believed in what the civilized Japanese had already refused to believe. At that time, very few people considered folklore to be a treasure. The fact that Yanagita decided to introduce local traditions into the urban circulation was a pioneer act. The attitude of the enlightened part of society to the beliefs in uh, to, to the beliefs in hosts which was widespread among the common people is indicative the philosopher and educator Inoue Enrio collected six volumes of legends about hosts and spirits but he did it with a very specific goal to prove that ghosts are nothing more than prejudice major government 
fought with such prejudice and tried to eliminate them. In Japan of that time, foreigners inter interested in the customs of ordinary people more than Japanese themselves. Japanese scholars preferred to study the customs of the natives of Taiwan, which became Japanese colony. Japan's transformation into colonial power marked a major shift in world outlook. Before the annexation of Taiwan, articles on Japanese customs appeared from time to time in the Tokyo Anthropological Journal. But after the annexation, Taiwanese customs became more popular. European ethnographers of that time studied primarily the so-called primitive ethnic groups becoming an object of study meant recognizing that one was at a lower stage of development than the scientist himself. Too many educated Japanese found it more pleasant to consider themselves a subject rather than an object of study. Yanagita was an independent person with a highly developed sense of contradiction. Focusing on Japanese folklore, Yanagita went against, against the tide. This is true, not only for the subject itself, but also for the language in which the legends of Tono were recorded. Yanagita's friends were progressive writers who told about their characters in a colloquial language. They tried to get rid of the legacy of, of the past era when the literary language or bungo was considered prestigious. And bungo was very far from the spoken language. Yanagita acted in a different way. He wrote down Sasaki's stories in bungo. That meant that in fact, he translated them. This greatly lessens the value of Tonda Managatari as a folklore source, but adds a literary dimension to the text. Thus, both in terms of subject and language, Tono Managatari was far from modern trends. Yanagita himself was well aware of the uniqueness of his work and boldly stated in the preface that his book goes against the spirit of the modern times. Anticipating that many people would be surprised by his approach, Yanagita appealed to the collections of Setsuva Konjaku Managatari created nine centuries ago, which of course was written in literary language. Konjaku tells about miracles and instructive incidents that happened in the days when Buddhism determined the vision of the Japanese. But that was a long time ago, says Yanagita, and Tono Managatari deals the realities of the present time. Numerous works of the Setsuwa consist of true stories that the author heard and collected them together. The so-called authors, as a rule, denied authorship, claiming that they were simply honestly writing down the accounts of eyewitnesses. Yanagita did the same. But on the cover of Tales from Tona, we see his name. Tona Managatari tells about contacts of mountain village people with mountain evil spirits, with mountain men, Yamautoko, Tengu, Kappa, wolves, bears, evil monkeys, cunning foxes. Stories tell about miracles and strange events. But unlike medieval Setsuwa, they lack generalization and moralizing. There are no attempts to describe the inner world of a person to reveal the psychological motives of actions in which were so interested Yanagita's literary friends. The heroes from Tono do not think, they act. The general atmosphere of legends from Tono is far from idyllic. Evil spirits do their terrible deeds. People are also far from ideal. Sometimes the narrative re uh, resembles a criminal chronicle. Murders are quite common. Yanagita wrote in the fore foreword 
that readers would shudder at these stories. And he himself does not feel any tender emotion toward the life of mountain dwellers. Yanagita was interested not only in evil spirits, but also in people who believed in them. He was interested in people who did not fit the pattern of the polite and socially safe lowland Japanese to whom he addressed his book. In other words, he was interested in marginals. What did Inagita mean by showing them to the rest of Japan? The key to understanding legends of Tono is contained in, contained in other publications of Yanagita, where he discusses the problem of the origin of the Japanese. According to Yanagita, our island empire was originally inhabited by native people who lived by hunting. The newcomers, the newcomers that is Japanese, possessed a higher culture. Its main feature is rice cultivation and drove the natives into the mountains. These mountain people are a separate race. Part of them descended from the mountains and were assimilated. During the Nara period, the assimilation was completed, but some of the native inhabitants are still, are still living in the mountain now. The mountain evil spirits revealed in folklore harm the Lowland Japanese, the reflection of the hostile feelings of the native inhabitants to the new karmas who conquered them. In the refined urban culture, mountains were personification of beauty for centuries. Shige Shigetaka gave a fresh start to glorification of mountains when he published his Nihon Fukeiron. Fujisan was becoming a kind of state cult in imperial Japan. But Yanagita showed that mountains were also a source of barbarism. Ideologists praised social harmony and told that it was a unique feature of the Japanese people. They insisted that the Japanese was a uniform nation. However, the, the Yanagita's folklore testified to the opposite. The mountain village society was full of cru cruelty. Local people feared and hated strangers. Yanagita's book was pioneering one because it, ga it gave a voice to people who had no voice earlier. Lowland Japanese considered them wild and, as and uncivilized, but knew little about them. The stories presented by Yanagita made a repulsive impression on them. Yanagita published Tono Monogatari at his, at his own expense. The book had a circulation of 350 copies. It went almost unnoticed. I think Yanagita wanted to impress and to tease his literary friends. He condemned them for pitiness and self-delusion. They were primarily interested in urban life they praised modern Western civilization and literature. Therefore, their reaction to Yanagita's work was mixed. The pioneer of Japanese ego novel, Watakushi Shusetsu, Tayama Katai, said that Yanagita tried to imitate the chat of, of a village old woman, and it was interesting as literary trick, but the content of stories did not appeal to him. Shimazaki Tosan concluded that the author wanted to enlighten people. However, the researcher of folk psychology and collector of miracles, as he called the author, was not as close to him as Yanagita the Traveler. In this respect, Yanagita, with his numerous travel notes, was, according to Shimazaki, unmatched. Shimazaki wanted to say, that legends of Tono were not the result of Yanagita's direct experience, but was just a recording of other people's stories. And only Izumi Kyoko, who made a name with uh, ghost entertainment fiction, found Yanagita's book based on oral ghost stories, Kaidan, extremely interesting and written, as he said, vividly. 
None of the reviewers found that Dona Managatari was of any scientific value. In any case, the reaction of Yanagita's literary friends was quite cold. And from that time on, Yanagita completely departed from literary circles. The reviews written not by writers, but by scientists did not appear at all. Respected experts did not accept Yanagita's idea about mountain and lowland races. After some time, he himself also abandoned it. Instead of it, he began to take more interest in another idea, the kinship of the Japanese and Okinawans. Yanagita's publishing and lecturing activities were extremely energetic, but Tono Monogatari was completely forgotten, both by the author himself and by the public. Second edition of Tono Monogatari appeared only after 25 years. In 1935, Yanagita turned 60, and an enlarged version of Tono Monogatari was published. This was due to the efforts of Uriguchi Shinobu, who was younger colleague of Yanagita. The book included 119 stories from the first edition, plus 299 new stories. But by this time, the term ethnology, Minzoku Gaku, was, al was already on hearing. In, a, in an explanation to the second edition, Yanagita wrote, that since the first edition, the situation has changed radically. <clears throat> in 1910, he was a loner, but since that time, many people had appeared doing the same work as himself. In the afterword to the book, Riguchi Shinobu noted that ethnology corresponds to the greatest extent to our heart and our land. The place named Tono was firmly associated in his mind with Yanagita. He called Tono the heavens of folklore. As for the history of the creation of additional stories, Riguchi said that Sensei had not bothered himself with an enlarged edition but his younger colleagues collected materials of the already deceased Sasaki and Sensei polished them with the hand of a master. And this is how Yanagita's new book appeared. In other words, the enlarged edition was also a literary processing and not the publication of the primary source. No commentaries were added. The edition stories to Tono Monogatari has never been very popular although the stories collected uh, there are not worse than those published before. In some respects, they're even more informative. The enlarged uh, version contained more Buddhist legends, more stories about the help of Buddhas and Shinto deities, uh, but frightening stories about terrible crimes committed by local residents and spirits were not so many. By this time, Yanagita had already abandoned his mountain theory and did not try to intimidate the reader with barbarism of his compatriots. New stories are written not in Bunga, but in a standard modern language and do not stand out from the discourse of the time as happened in the first edition. However, the publication of the enlarged version brought tales from Tona out of oblivion and the afterword by Ariguchi Shinobu was almost the first recognition of the value of these stories on the part of a researcher, not a writer. After Ariguchi, reviews of other professionals began to appear. For a quarter of a century, professional environment had formed. The University of Yanagita prompted praises. The reviewers called Yanagita no other than sensei labeled Tono Monogatari at the beginning of Japanese ethnology, when with the exception of Yanagita, no one was interested in folklore and in ethnology. No negative reviews were published. To cut a long story short, 
In 1935, Yanagita was appointed to the position of the father of Japanese ethnology and folklore studies, and he did not reject this title. Yanagita gained wide popularity in a narrow professional circle, but not many ordinary people read enlarged edition of Tono Mangatari. The general public had not yet matured to the beauty of the literary style of the first edition of Tono Monogatari. The specialist in French literature, Kuwabara Takeo, praised the merits of Yanagita's style and even compared a tiny text with the mon monumental Thousand and One Nights collection. But at the same time, he complained that with the exception of Akutagawa Rinosuke, none of the writers appreciated legends of Tono. However, Kuabara was unheard. Rikuchi Shinobu who was not only a researcher, but also a poet. And in, <clears throat> he published a long rhapsodic poem about how he bought the first edition of Tono Monogatari in a second-hand bookstore, but the poem did not make an impression on the public. The next edition of Tono Monogatari had to wait until 1940. Uh, uh, 48. In the post-war period, Yanagita received wide recognition. During the war, too many prominent figures were engaging in a fierce propaganda of militarism and nationalism, and there were not so many public figures to fit new democratic Japan. Yanagita was one of them. He studied not subjects of imperial Japan, but lives of common people and it was very profitable because according to the new constitution, people of Japan were more influential than emperor of Japan. Persons who were talking at that time about demos, Minshu, Jinmin, Jomin, and so on, had a good chance to be heard. One more reason was also significant for the recognition of Yanagita. At the beginning of his career, he held quite prominent positions in gov uh, and government officials knew him well and trusted him. So, Yanagita was appointed into the last composition of the Privy Council. He was selected as member of numerous educational and science committees. He was involved in writing textbooks for the new School of Democratic Japan. He received government grants for his studies and was awarded the Order of Culture. After his death in 1962, he was, he was awarded senior grade uh, third court, uh, court rank. So Yanagita turned out to be the highest ranking humanitarian in the modern history of Japan. However, the peak of his fame falls on the 70s when Nihon Jinron discourse flourished. Within the framework of this discourse, problems related to the identity of the Japanese nation were discussed. <clears throat> A huge number of writings of the most varied quality were published on this topic. The subject of Japanese, uh, Yanagita studies was the ethnology of the Japanese people. He himself called his science Ikoku Minzoku Gaku, ethnology of one country, Japan. So it is not surprising that in the 70s, there was a real boom associated with his name. This boom was prepared in the 60s. Writers played a huge role in it. The first number of Bungaku magazine in 1961 was dedicated to Yanagita. Out of 11 articles, only two were written by ethnologists. The famous poet Nishaki Jinzaburo wrote with poetic generosity that if it were not Yanagita with his mystical talent, Japanese studies of ancient history and folklore would be in a childish, childish uh, state. Nishaki continued, after Yanagita gave up government service for many decades, from morning till night, enveloped in puffs of tobacco smoke, he was immersed in thoughts of Japan, detached from everything else like a mountain hermit. 
To the role of the main masterpiece of Yanagita was selected Dono Monogatari. Its discoverer at that time was a well-known literary critic, Soma Tsuneo, who in 1961 published an essay entitled The Literary Nature of uh, Yanagita's Ethnology. Noting a passing cognitive value of Tona Monogatari, Soma admitted that this book touched the depths of his soul, which only literature can do. In stories of Tona Mangatari, they are both the poetry of the peasant heart and the keen eye of the observer. The energetic style of Yanagita is distinguished by health and reminds uh, of medieval sets to literature. In the preface to the first edition of Legends of Tono, uh, Yanagita mentioned Kanjako Mangatari, but modestly stipulated that his stories did not stand comparison with medieval wisdom. Many years elapsed since that time, and now Tono Monogatari was incorporated into the history of Japanese literature. In the second edition of uh, Kojien, published uh, in 1969, Tono Monogatari was still absent from the list of Yanagita's outstanding works. In subsequent editions of the dictionary, Tono Monogatari was already there. Mishima Yukio played a huge role in the glorification of Yanagita. In the last year of his life, he stated in uh, uh, Yomiuri Shimbun that Tono Monogatari is a monument to the birth of their discipline for ethnologists, but he personally reads it as an outstanding work of literature. Yanagita's style is very good. He cherishes words as cherished gold. The paradox is that Tono Monogatari's style is unique for Yanagita. After Legends of Tono were published, he gave up experimenting with Bungo. Many of Yanagita's works are recordings of his lectures made by other people, and that gives these works a touch of negligence. In the overwhelming majority of his works, Yanagita did not cherish words, but wasted and splashed them so that his style can rather be described as very vague and at times even <coughs> indistinct. Yanagita's style is far from afar uh, aphoristic. His ideas could be summarized, but they are almost impossible to quote. The poet Yashimoto Takaki likened Yanagita's style to endless stringing of beads. Anthropologist Ishida Ichiro stated that translating Yanagita's writings into other languages is, a difficult, is as difficult as translating poetry. This is one of the main reasons why Yanagita's name is almost unknown outside of Japan for general public. Even many Japanese native speakers uh, likened reading um, Yanagita's writings to wandering through images. The problem of style was of little concern to Yanagita in his major years. He often dictated his works or told uh, key ideas to his students who wrote, down, uh, uh, who wrote them down and completed the text under the name of Yanagita. An author who cares about his style does not entrust other people to express his thoughts. In many Yanagita's writings, there is a stylistic case, fluid and enveloping charm so difficult trans to transfer into other languages. Japanese literature gave birth to countless essays, Zuhitsu, following the brush, where the rules of clarity and logic are not observed in principle. Mishima praised Yanagita for the clarity of presentation, but Ariguchi Shinobu uh, admired precisely the essayism of Yanagita, praising the greatest merit in those works where Yanagita does not bother himself with endless arguments, but directly proceeds to conclusions in which he believes. Whether this can serve as a praise for a researcher is a difficult question, but Ariguchi's conclusion is closer to the truth than Mishima's. 
Nevertheless, many people liked Mishima's assessment of Yanagita's style. In 1972, uh, ethnologist Makida Shigeru called Legends of Tono a pagoda of golden words. In the same year, in the preface to Tono Mangatari, the famous ethnologist, writer, and poet Tanigawa Kenichi wrote that the place name Tono is symbolic for Japanese ethnology, like Yayoi and Omori for archaeology. In the Tokyo quarter of Yayoi, certain type of ceramics was first discovered and it gave the name to the whole period. In another Tokyo area, Omori, Edward Morse uh, found in 1877 the first Kaizuka, shell mount or trash heap of ancient man, and this event marked the birth of Japanese archaeology. 1972 marked the 10th uh, anniversary, anniversary of Yanagita's death. From this time on, reissues of Tono Monogatari were carried out several times every year in different publishing houses. Until this time, Tono Monogatari was published, published six times for uh, 62 years. In 1975, an English translation of Tono Mangatari by Ronald Morse appeared. It was sponsored by Japan Foundation. More and more people joined in the glorification of legends of Tono. A lot of ethnological fever was shown by journalists. According to their numerous interpretations and retellings, it's quite possible to conclude that the Nagito is children's writer because cruel, ghosts and evil spirits in whom people of Tona really believed appeared now as cute and funny. Yanagita was confident that he would frighten the Japanese with Tona Monogatari, but now it turned out that they simply love it. At the same time, many ethnologists also took a great interest in journalism and began to find in Tona Monogatari phenomena that were not the Behind the naive stories of the beginning of the 20th century, some of them even felt kanjiru, reflections of the, Japani, uh, of, of the Japanese of German period. I would like to remind that in German period, German period ended more than 2000 years ago and there were no Japanese race uh, uh, at all at that time. Yanagita's All Japan National Theme was ensured not so much by his work as a scientist, but by the literary, ma ma literary merits of Tono Mangatari. Future Nobel Prize winner Oeken Zaboro also praised Yanagita's style, but especially stressed what he called brave imagination. Oya prized imagination of Yanagita in uh, Kaiju no Michi, Sea Root, another famous piece by Yanagita. In this work, despite all the available facts, he argued that the ancestors of the Japanese were the Akinawans. According to Oya, Yanagita, with the help of his talented poetic discourse, managed to expand the boundaries of his art, which overcomes time and penetrates into the layers of ancient consciousness and turns Yanagita and a great, uh, into a great old man, the narrator of the epic. Yanagita's errors as a researcher fade under the force of this discourse, but he was able to achieve more important goal, as uh, 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 says uh, Oeken Zabaro. His creative imagination awakened creative imagination of other people. I would like to remind that the popularity of Kaiju no Michi was primarily due to the fact that at the time of its publication <clears throat> in 1961, the Japanese were fighting uh, for the return of Okinawa and Yanagita's book was very instrumental for achieving this goal. In his youth, Yanagita abandoned poetry and literature because considered them worthless. He moved away from the literary circle, but next generation of writers embraced him. Uh, <clears throat> Several years ago, well-known writer K. 
Hyogoku Natsuhiko published a translation or retelling of Legends of Tona into modern language, an honor that, ha that had previously been conferred on only famous works of ancient and medieval literature. In this translation, Tona Monogatari has lost its bunga stylistic charm that captivated outstanding writers of previous times. In my presentation, I wanted to show that the destiny of Yanagita and the destiny of Tono Monogatari are two different things. Yanagita himself treated Tono Monogatari without special reverence, since he considered it a work not so much scientific as literary. But the book turned out to be long living precisely because of its literary touch, and now it is considered by general public to be the main achievement of Yanagita. The text is equal to itself only as long as the book is closed and no one reads it. When different people in different times open the book and begin to read it, it acquires many meanings of which the author himself had not the slightest idea. Yanagita thought of himself as a non-fiction writer, but fiction writers but fiction writers made the main contribution to his glorification as a storyteller. However, in all dictionaries and reference books, Yanagita is certified as a scientist. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meshirakov Alexander. Very interesting expose about the transformation of <laughs> and a work of uh, literature into a work of science and then back into literature. Uh, very interesting. I never had considered that uh, to that extent. So I thank you very much for presenting all these um, new ideas and quoting so many references to other authors as they saw uh, Yanagida's work and especially Tono Monogatari. Uh, I think we have a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, is that correct, uh, Vasily? Can we, uh, do we have some time for a few questions? Yes, of course, we have, we have. Uh, okay, fine. So, um, I, I would suggest then, uh, I'm, I'm not really familiar to this, but if you have, uh, uh, a question uh, that you can actually raise your hand. You have below your screen, somewhat to the right side of your screen, at least in my case, um, um, a button um, that's marked reactions. And there you find raise your hand like I do now. And then you can go ahead. Uh, I, uh, you have to unmute uh, your um, uh, microphone and also, I suppose, uh, show your face by clicking on your video. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. You're, you're... Okay, so uh, please go ahead. Any questions or remarks? Uh, maybe I can, uh, yeah, well, it's, I, it's not really probably a question, but rather a remark, but I'm amazed by the difference uh, between uh, people assessing the style uh, of the same writing. I mean, some people, you know, um, <laughs> glorify its its uh, clarity, others rather <laughs> its uh, contortion or its uh, profundity. Um, so, uh, you know, we're talking about the same text, basically. And it's amazing how people can uh, assess and, and judge a text so differently and appreciate a text so differently. Um, uh, I, I can't really explain it. Probably uh, it has to do with um, uh, the fact or the question whether the person in question is um, someone with a poetical uh, background or not. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether Professor uh, Meshiryakov has any explanation for that. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, uh, you can explain it uh, by, uh, well, Different, uh, different political situation and uh, political views of people. 
uh, well, uh, people in what I would call normal society uh, has uh, uh, have different tastes, and uh, I find uh, the variety of uh, opinions uh, uh, very diff uh, very interesting. Uh, well. Uh, not only for uh, for researcher but in general too because uh, well uh, the variety of uh, opinions uh, makes our life interesting mm -hmm. so uh, um, uh, well, uh, the problem is really uh, very interesting to me, and uh, I published uh, some other works uh, which uh, can uh, can be uh, well interpreted in the same way. Uh, in the same uh, uh, way, for instance, I published a book on uh, Mount Fuji, mm -hmm. and uh, there. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, trace uh, how Mount Fuji, how Fujisan was uh, interpreted uh, in uh, Nara uh, or Heian Japan uh, in medieval ages uh, and uh, in imperial Japan uh, and now and it is uh, well uh, an amazing amazing intellectual adventure mm -hmm. that means that uh, uh, if uh, we see uh, Fujisan as uh, uh, an object which changed very little through the ages it changed but not so much but opinion uh, opinions of people uh, who are viewing it uh, from the uh, from the bottom from the earth? They are changing very, very, uh, very quickly. Oh, well, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the nature the nature of uh, our uh, of uh, manhood is very fluid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether there's any other question. Um, if so, uh, Harry, please. Uh, yes, I see one. Uh, wait a minute. Do I see a raised hand? No, I don't. Oh, yes, uh, Professor Mikhailova, go ahead. Yes, I don't know how to switch to the... Mo Do you hear me? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I was... Uh, uh, well, a small, very small question uh, to Professor Mishrikov. Uh, are you not trying to translate um, Tono Monogatari into Russian? Oh, mm. I once made an attempt. I think I was a student at the time. I translated, uh, well, a, a half part of a chapter. And I received the lowest grade for translation <laughs> by, well, my teacher <laughs> at the university. So <laughs> since that time, I'm afraid of translations, actually. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I published I published a book uh, uh, on uh, Yanagita, and there are some stories from Tona, uh, Tona uh, as an appendix there. Uh, but uh, I, I I did not uh, translate them uh, all for uh, many reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, this uh, bungo uh, bungo style. Uh, uh, well, many Japanese uh, writers uh, praised it. Uh, um, uh, it's very, uh, very difficult uh, to, uh, well, uh, um, to uh, uh, to translate in. Uh, as I told in my uh, uh, already uh, already talked, uh, this is not uh, uh, well uh, a work, uh, uh, a real work of uh, ethnology because it is retelling. And uh, uh, as as such, uh, it does not uh, does not uh, 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 well. Uh, serious ethnologists uh, cannot uh, uh, view it uh, uh, very seriously now. Uh, his real 
his real deed was uh, that he was a pioneer. Uh, pioneers uh, always made very, very many uh, mistakes. And uh, uh, we often remember their names, uh, but uh, do not remember uh, what they did actually. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, the, the, you know, have the, the stories that were collected and uh, rewritten in Bungo by Yanagida, have they been studied subsequently in a really scientific, um, according to really scientific methodology, so as, uh, in, you know, so to speak, to redo the work of Yanagida, but then scientifically, or was it too late by then? <laughs> uh, well, um... Uh, very many uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, ethnologists and fol folklorists, they collected uh, many, uh, many legends, stories and uh, uh, folk, folk tales from all over Japan. And that was uh, a, great, a great job and did very professionally. And... Uh, um, Yanagita, uh, they uh, uh, they continued uh, uh, Yanagi, uh, Yanagita's uh, job uh, and uh, consider him uh, really as a beginner uh, of uh, their profession. Okay.